Our next speaker is a, a, a valuable friend of the Mars Society. He even uh, judges our, U, our URC, uh, University Rover Challenges that happen at MDRS. And we're very grateful to him for his participation with us. He's also a cognitive scientist specializing in the nature and applications of artificial intelligence whose work combines theory and methods from computer science, psychology, anthropology, and philosophy. He was formerly the chief scientist for human-centered computing at NASA Ames Research Center of the Intelligent Systems Division from 1998 to 2013. Please welcome Dr. Bill Clancy. Well, thank you. Uh, well, so far this morning, we've had four really solid uh, planetary science and technology talks. And I figure I'm part of the segue to the Religion on Mars panel. So, today I'm going to tell you about a science fiction story. Uh, there's actually a case study called Arcturus IV. And it was used in the early 1950s to teach engineers uh, how to be more creative. And the idea was used as a kind of uh, role-playing uh, game to break the ice in a, a product design course. And my talk will be on how we have brought this case study to life uh, at MDRS. So Arcturus IV was conceived by the MIT professor John Arnold, uh, and it was for mechanical engineering and, pr and product design. And we can see a picture of him here uh, from uh, 1953 in his MIT office. And apparently one of the alien beings has been uh, shipped to the Massachusetts Intergalactic Traders, uh, by coincidence, MIT. Um, and you can see uh, on the wall is his uh, mantra for the creative process. He was actually a psychologist originally by training, even though he became a professor in mechanical engineering. And what he wanted to get across to his engineers was that design was not a thing and it wasn't draftsmanship only or uh, prettying up a product to make it more marketable and to increase sales. Um, but it was a creative problem solving process and they needed to understand the psychology of problem solving and what creativity in fact was and he wanted to open up their minds so that they could think differently and solve really challenging social problems. That was his emphasis. So you probably never heard of John Arnold, actually. Uh, he unfortunately died at a, at a fairly early age. He didn't have any books. He published a few conference papers. And you may have noticed my uh, co-author on this presentation is his son, Jack. And the last few years, we've been working and rediscovering his work and, and publishing it. And I'll tell you more about that later. Um, when John Arnold passed away, the New York Times wrote a rather extensive obituary uh, about him and his work. And, and what I'm going to do is read from that very well-written story and uh, illustrate it with the, the graphics and uh, what turned out to be memos that appeared uh, in the Arcturus uh, science fiction story that he gave to the students. So it says, Professor Arnold developed at MIT some highly imaginative classroom methods to stimulate creative thinking by his students. His science fiction approach caused a stir among traditional educators and conservative engineering leaders. The professor devised these unconventional methods as a result of his belief that the imagination can be trained by temporarily freeing students from their accustomed environment and placing them in a new imaginary one. And you might see where I'm going to be going here with MDRS. For example, he would set up such fictitious situations as this. You're living in the year 2953. Space travel is well established and there's a great deal of trade in the galaxy. He doesn't talk about how they traveled such big distances or communicated its science fiction story. He then would describe a special governmental bureau that had gathered information for use in trading with other planets. The information is presented in the form of letters and special reports that were printed on prepared letterheads and forums of various fictitious agencies and people. 
and his comment was that this would add classroom realism. Now actually, an internet search would show you that John Arnold was quite famous during the early 1950s. He had a uh, feature article, it's actually his most important pedagogical piece, uh, in astounding science fiction in 1953. Uh, in 1955, Life magazine ran a feature article called Voyage to Arcturus IV. It gave his biography, it talked about the course, and the effect that he was having on industrial design. In 1956, Popular Science had a quite extensive article that included a number of the designs that the students had prepared. Uh, Frederick Pohl, in uh, his science fiction novel, Gem, refers to the MIT Science Fiction Society that was involved in writing this story and talks about uh, the course and the case study as well. So here I have a number of excerpts that uh, we can find in Life uh, magazine and popular science articles. And the, um, it, it really illustrates two of the key ideas that Arnold had. Uh, one today we would call a holistic perspective. He wanted his students to understand these beings on this other planet that they were designing for, called Arcturus IV. And they were to consider the physiology, the psychology, their culture, and the whole uh, environment of the planet in coming up with good designs. Now, as I said, Arnold was a psychologist. And so he believed that this process of becoming more creative was actually a process of self-growth getting to know yourself better, getting to know how you thought, and, and reflecting on how did you solve problems. So he taught them the psychology of design, and he also believed that there were certain, from his observations, certain factors that were preventing people from being as open and creative as they might be that he called blocks to creativity. And these included perceptual, emotional, and cultural blocks. So his idea in getting the students to uh, put themselves in the, the place and thinking about the beings on this other planet and design for them was to lose their earthly shackles, as was quoted here in the Life magazine article. So now continuing with uh, the text that was in the obituary, I have um, included some illustrations of the memos that were in this case study and written by and given by, uh, given to the students. So here's a letter from the chairman of the board of the Massachusetts Intergalactic Traders, he would say. The letter asked the bureau called the Terran Exporting Council Headquarters by coincidence tech for information on the discovery of life on our tourist fort. And here we see RZ Holenhead, who's the chairman of the board, as you know, our company has been actively engaged for some time now in galactic trading, and we're well equipped for the design, manufacture, and distribution of, of machines and products for human and subhuman use. So a bureau file on our tourist four included a letter from the solar and galactic explorer, Mr. Gary Toff, who discovered the planet and described the type of life found there. The file detailed information on the size, density, temperature extremes, atmosphere, length of the day, and the year, and other data. And this is the actual uh, report that you see here with this word copy and confidential received by the MIT uh, uh, group. Uh, and we believe that the dates that are in here uh, were the actual uh, days and months in which these memos were written and they've only added a, a thousand years uh, to, to for, uh, for credibility. And <laughs> so uh, the, uh, here we have um, Arnold in his uh, guise of uh, Mr. Holenhead um, requesting assistance. Oh, I, I, I should also say he worked with the MIT Science Fiction Society uh, to get their help in uh, developing these memos. And this particular date, uh, March 20, was four days after the first uh, meeting with uh, the students of the society. So they were probably writing some of these memos. Uh, the names here were also derived from students or professors who were participating, and obviously J. Arnold 
uh, was the, the director of design and, and product design and so on. So uh, the memos reported that uh, plants, plant life grew upside down, so that was going to be a problem in developing some harvesting machines. Um, the people on the planet, by the way, were called Methanians, who apparently evolved from birds. Uh, they were short, relatively light, and seemed to have hollow bones filled with uh, hydrogen and helium. And all this posed other challenges uh, for, the, uh, for the designers. The economists on Project Victorious learned that the development of the planet resembled that of the United States in the early 20th century. Electricity was used for light and power, but nothing was known of electronics. Trade opportunities were therefore a little more limited. So the very first class to use the case study was tasked with developing uh, household products or uh, personal use products. And, and here uh, the chairman of the board is directing Arnold uh, to uh, pass this on uh, to his students as a requirement. Now the students, interestingly enough, uh, wrote memos back uh, following the same genre, re addressing these fictitious uh, people, uh, and um, included their, as their project reports, new memos. And these are some of their designs, and these were um, included in the astounding science fiction uh, and popular science articles in particular. Now I mentioned the um, MIT Science Fiction Society was involved in this, uh, and it turns out their very first meeting apparently was March 16th, 1951. Amazingly enough, the featured speaker, amazing coincidence, at that uh, meeting was Isaac Asimov, a well-known biochemist at Boston University. And he had a book that he wanted to tell them about uh, called uh, Foundation. And we're very lucky that the notes from this meeting have been preserved, and, uh, and I managed to get them from the archives at MIT. And they say, Arnold, speaking informally after Asimov, told members of the Society of a new phase in the text product design course. Under this projected setup, students will design products for use in alien environments, specifically other planets. He invited members of the society to contribute ideas on possible environments. So it's quite interesting. If you look at the first page of Foundation, it mentions the Arcturus sector. So I think it's, it's highly likely here that Asimov and the students who were at that meeting uh, came up with the, the overall story and the idea of writing these memos and so on that would be given to the students. Now, uh, three years later, it's interesting that the guest speaker is not Asimov, but Arnold. And uh, it says he will speak on the development of the famed Arcturus IV project in extraterrestrial design. And by the way, there'll be another guest there, uh, the biochemist and a prominent science fiction author, uh, Isaac Asimov. Now, over the course of three years, Arnold presented uh, this case study, again, as an icebreaker in his product design course, and all of the memos that were written and given to the students and all of the ones that they wrote were collected into a tech report that came out of the Creative Engineering Lab at MIT, that's an actual name, uh, in 1953. And you can see it amounted to about 100 pages. Uh, it's quite interesting that these memos were of the designs were presented to the students so that each year they were seeing what had been done before and allow them to learn the genre uh, so that they could uh, mimic uh, the form and continue to contribute to this evolving file, uh, which was a case study. And apparently Arnold was trying to also teach a design process that might be followed, say, in a corporation. So I want to shift now uh, to talking more about Arnold's theory of design and how that relates to MDRS. So he, these are quotes from a speech that Arnold gave in 1955. And I think to understand um, where Arnold was coming from, he was a great synthesizer, but he carried everything to a new level. So in 1950, Guilford, the head of the American Psychological Association, gave a very uh, influential talk on the topic that creativity should be a subject for a psychologist to study. 
and he was one who was one of the early people to study problem solving that became uh, our modern cognitive science. But Arnold and other people that influenced him were very much affected by the Red Scare, the fear of communism in the, night, the early 50s. In Arnold's words, they were concerned about, quote, the trend towards a herd state, which is being accelerated by those who incessantly insist that we all be integrated. So this is the image of the cookie cutter workers that are marching into a factory to participate in an assembly line. The era of the book, William White, or, uh, warning us about what was happening, that he called organization man. The mantra they were concerned about was assimilate, or as the Borg would say, resistance is futile. But Maurer, who wrote in the, uh, the Saturday Evening Post about never urge people to do together what the self-reliant among them can do better alone, uh, William White and, 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 uh, and, and many others uh, really presented a very different perspective. And Arnold's idea was that if we could incite in you your creative potential, something that he believed was we all had um, available to us, um, that that would make you as an individual see what you could do for society and get you uh, realize uh, what you were capable of, of accomplishing. And he would, he would fill his talks with examples of inventors and psychologists um, and these people like uh, Buckminster Fuller and Maslow would present uh, at his classes. So his number one idea for engineering again is that it should address important big social problems. He was concerned about overpopulation and uh, poverty and, and issues like this. Um, he was influenced greatly by his colleague at MIT, uh, Buckminster Fuller, and he had this notion, his, his holistic perspective was uh, apparently adopted from what Fuller called comprehensive design. But Arnold was also keying in to Fuller's notion of, of what he called anticipatory design. Think about five, 10, 20 years from now. If you build that, what are gonna be the implications? This very much gets into an ecological perspective, global perspective that we have today. Um, Arnold, again, as a psychologist, felt that even though you had this potential, uh, it had to be taught. And there were things that might prevent you from realizing uh, what you were capable of. So one of the things I came to realize, I always knew Maslow's notion of self-actualization, but here I realized it's not a bootstrapping notion, it means realizing what you're, what's yourself, what you are capable of. It's, and it's something that Arnold said, you weren't going to self-actualize, you had to be helped along and guided by others. Uh, Maslow actually gave a talk called Emotional Blocks to Creativity at the 1957 uh, seminar. So today his legacy is called design thinking and Arnold is very much uh, increasingly seen as uh, the progenitor of that. Uh, he was brought to Stanford in 57. He wasn't very well appreciated. He did get tenure at MIT, but Fred Terman, who's seen by some as so-called father of Silicon Valley, saw that uh, Arnold had the potential to really transform engineering at Stanford. Uh, and his uh, connection with industry and giving seminars was very much the perspective that Terman had for Silicon Valley and for Stanford. Um, Arnold's uh, hires and the people who uh, they trained really have transformed design uh, and Stanford certainly been one of the hotbeds of that uh, since the late 50s. Um, his first hire was an industrial designer, uh, Bob McKim. And uh, he emphasized prototyping and what he called need finding. He wrote a very successful book called Experiences in Visual Thinking. Uh, Jim Adams uh, had a degree, a minor in art at UCLA. He became a mechanical engineering professor. And when he wrote his book, he incorporated uh, many of the exercises that Arnold used on how to ask good questions. And uh, his book was called uh, Conceptual Blockbusting. 
Larry Leifer was originally a, a surfboard designer, and he was going to be uh, Arnold's first PhD student in 63 when Arnold passed away. He's really carried on the original design division and formed the Center for Design Research at Stanford in the early 80s, and he's been trying to bring together uh, science and, and design in, in many ways. Uh, the first professor hired by Arnold was in 1962, uh, Bernie Roth. Uh, amazingly enough, he's still actively teaching at Stanford today, and you can do the math on how many years that is. Uh, he was highly influenced by the human potential movement, and that was part of this personal growth notion of the 50s. Uh, they, Arnold and he knew uh, Werner Erhardt, and uh, in the more recent book by uh, Bernie a couple of years ago called The Achievement Habit is pushing that same idea. Uh, Bob McKim's uh, key student, David Kelly, um, uh, co-founded with his brother uh, a design firm at Palo, in Palo Alto called IDEO. It's uh, famous for the Apple mouse, uh, still a very important place. Uh, and Kelly and Bernie Roth formed, uh, just a couple of years ago, the Hustle Plotner D School at Stanford, which is bringing really the realizing a lot of what Arnold's vision was. Uh, Kelly's most recent book, Creative Confidence, you can see is exactly right in that, in that, same, that same form. So, MDRS, you probably have seen the, some of the connections I wanted to draw here. Um, our concern isn't Arcturus IV, of course, but Sol IV. And what we've done is, rather than writing these memos about these other beings and their place and, what's, and making up a story there, we are actually role playing. We, we've put ourselves, we've built the habitat, and we are living, we are, we are bringing to life this uh, case study. And we are able to, to uh, leverage exactly those same ideas that Arnold was after, of promoting play and the imagination. We've, we're, we're engaged, and we all know it's called a sim, but it's a kind of a simulation game. And there are certain theories and writings today about world building games like the World of Warcraft that I think we can understand some of what we're gaining and doing uh, and accomplishing at MDRS through some of those terms. So MDRS is a, a fantastic place in the sense of being promoting fantasy that stimulates our imagination, gives us a playground, literally, where we can try out things. It's immersive, so we're living and we're, we're engaging in uh, being Martians, and that allows us to reflect on what we're doing, what are the tools we have, what are the, the organization and the protocols that we follow, and it's revealing needs to us uh, by living uh, through this process. And one of the most interesting concepts in the world building analyses is what they call a bounded learning environment. So we have, when playing the simulation game, we are constraining the roles that people play, uh, their activities, the tools that they use, it all has to relate to Mars in some way. And yet it's bounded. There's only a certain space that we move within and people can't move into that space while we're there playing that game. And that involves our communications as well. So this has given me a certain perspective on what my team and, uh, experienced over five uh, field seasons at MDRS when I was at NASA. Um, and of course, today we have the technology that allowed us not just to write, do things on paper, but to design them and every year incrementally improve uh, our tools. We were building a voice commanding, a voice commanded uh, system that could be used for uh, Mars astronauts and control robots and, and so on. Um, and I call this empirical requirements analysis at the time. It was partly a dig at the, all the emphasis on requirements analysis and saying it has to be scientific, it has to be based on prototypes and experiments, it has to be empirical. And that's what we were able to do at MDRS. But the other thing is that it, it was really, I think we, we tend to miss this, and that's where Arnold's has really given me an insight, we're learning how to be more creative. It, it, it's those of us who have gone through that experience have that role playing, have, have been able to open our imaginations and to think more, to put ourselves, project ourselves uh, to the Mars environment. And it's very interesting that even though NASA supported and allowed up my team to go there over those five seasons, management, and they wrote great press releases about what we were doing, management never got involved 
in controlling or asking questions. They sent an observer once, the deputy uh, director of Ames. She saw while we were there and she was gone in one day. She said, good, yeah, continue. Uh, so that was freedom from that whole Ames environment where we were embedded with competing groups in the intelligence systems division. My team could do what they wanted to do. And that's why I think we succeeded so well. So you can read a lot more about this. Uh, I've written an extensive Wikipedia article about John uh, Arnold. Uh, Jack Arnold and I have been publishing uh, Arnold's works. Uh, we have two books out right now. One are the Creative Engineering Seminars, which include the presentations by uh, uh, McKim and uh, Maslow, for example. And Jack Arnold has made a great accomplishment of resetting in all the fonts and all of the words, copy and so on, all replicated in the Arcturus case study. You can have a full collection of uh, all of those memos. Um, and it includes the Astounding Science Fiction article. Um, and both of these books are available for $3 each on, uh, on Kindle. Uh, now, if you'd like to learn a little more, uh, you might be interested in the book Make It New, which uh, places John Arnold's contributions to Silicon Valley in a historical context that just came out uh, two years ago. And if you'd like to learn more about this perspective on how play and imagination relate to innovation, uh, I recommend the book uh, A New Culture for Learning. Well, thank you, and, I, and maybe I have a few minutes for questions. Um, so, uh, actually, one of my um, hobbies, at least back in the UK, was uh, uh, live action role play. Um, and I was just wondering whether you think there's a uh, scope for actually um, a live action role play group kind of coming in and, and writing a game set in, in the MTRS or something similar and kind of exploring group dynamics from a kind of an explicitly play context. I understand you were saying to use MDRS as a way of uh, understanding role playing and studying it. Uh, uh, possibly, or, or just simply using using a role playing game as a um, a, a kind of a context for exploring um, group dynamic situations sure. in a sort of fictional story Absolutely. context. Absolutely, it's 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 quite open to what we how we want to use that that whole area, and it's important to consider too the whole BLM landscape that we have available that in restricted ways. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Right I'm just kind of curious, how did you come across this story? <laughs> well, I, you know, I didn't want to get into it because it's a little bit longer, but it turns out I live in John Arnold's house. <laughs> and uh, I, he, he built the place in 57. It's in the hills of Stanford. And I moved in there in 87. And, and as the internet became available and uh, I was really interested in the architect, uh, William Worcester, who was quite famous, and I was researching William Worcester. And that's when, after living there for 25 years, I realized I'm sitting in John Arnold's living room, and, and all this relates so much to my interest in human-centered design. So uh, it's been a really remarkable experience, and especially getting to know uh, his son, Jack, who's been uh, very receptive to this. I'm, I'm curious as to if there's any sort of like OODA loop or map of motivation or any sort of workflow one uses to get through this uh, methodology of being more creative or more inventive in situations like this. Uh, a, uh, a, a, you, you were asking about motivation and an approach to... Or, or methodology around, is there a workflow or methodology yeah, I, I around this? I think um, the people in the D school have a, a, a sense of a curriculum or an approach of what they're trying to get across. And, and that's probably the, the best reification of a, a teaching method uh, today. Uh, so, th so they're doing a lot of uh, paper, a lot of exercises as groups, how they design their space and use their furniture and all that flexibly. They're trying to convey a whole mindset to them of, of change and, and uh, of course today the emphasis is on teamwork. And, and how uh, there's diverse contributions made in the team. Uh, I'm very intrigued personally of what are the aspects of individual growth that 
Arnold was emphasizing that perhaps we, we've lost and we want to bring back into our teamwork uh, notion. And that would be part of the motivation, for example. I've been talking to my uh, teammates at URC in the Rover Challenge to try and understand why are we all part of that and, and why do we all continue to contribute? How does that relate to us individually and to the Mars Society and our mission that we all share? We have one last question. Right over here, Bill. Hey, Bill, Larry. Years. <laughs> have you been? Uh, I want to I wanna mention to everyone that Bill and I worked together at JSC a number of years ago, and uh, we developed uh, a lot of it came from Bill and, and, and his team that he was working with, a creative approach to what kind of questions uh, an astronaut would need to ask his spacesuit and what kind of answers would have to come back uh, to, to survive, uh, to get back in the least amount of time, to understand what the spacesuit is doing and to understand what the human body is doing. Uh, and all this uh, ended up in a bioadvisory algorithm which we actually implemented and tested uh, in a chamber. So uh, that's going to be demonstrated this afternoon in the talk I'm giving. I don't know if you've ever seen the video of that test yeah. that we actually did. And I bet did. you appreciate our voice commanding emphasis in 2002 uh, much more now. I, I certainly do. But anyway, you're all invited to come and look at 2.30 in the afternoon about this, this right. program that did all that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.